Hey, this is Jared Cochran with Family Church. Welcome to our podcast. I'm excited that you're here. I hope that God moves through this message to reach you so he can move through your life. Be sure to share and subscribe so that we can reach the world with God's word. Enjoy the message. Was there anybody else as nervous as I was during that whole thing? I was, I was, I haven't seen that. I intentionally did not want to see it. I was nervous the whole time because you know how it is when kids get asked questions. It can go anywhere and you never know where it's going to end up at. Years ago when Brandon was a little boy, they asked prayer requests in the uh, children's Sunday school class that he was in and he was praying for the teacher to pray that his daddy would stop smoking. I got in trouble for that when they all came to me after church. So happy Father's Day to everybody. Just we, we appreciate the day. I, I love the fact that we get to celebrate a day. Six weeks ago, we celebrated Mother's Day. Today, we're celebrating Father's Day. So we're going to go after it this morning. If you have your Bible, open with me to the book of Ephesians. Uh, just a thank you to everybody for last week. Kathy and I and our family was out of town. Uh, we were gone to Ocean Isle, where we've been going for 24 years to, to minister in a chapel up there. And Daniel Williams handled the morning service. I heard he did. He handled it with, with flair. And then <laughs> a reminder, just a couple of reminders for the men. How many men are in the room? I can tell. You're so ebullient. Uh, next Saturday from 5 to 7 is our Beast Feast. We're going to be meeting in the event room over there. Uh, we are preparing meals. We're preparing stuff to do. We just want to pull the men together and just spend some time with one another. So if you would, wives, remind your husbands. Set a reminder for him, please, to be here from 5 to 7. We're going to have a beast feast. We're going to eat all kinds of amazing food and celebrate some time together. You won't want to miss it. It's going to be fantastic. And then the weekend following that is the art of marriage. You won't want to miss that. Stop by the information center and get some more information on that. I don't know how you're supposed to follow that up, but I'm going to try my best this morning. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 1. The Word of God, if you wouldn't stand with me, please, as we read that together this morning, standing for the Word together. Verse 1, children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. Where are the parents at? That's your the amen moment, right? That's your hallelujah. Preach, pastor. Go ahead. Children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with you. And you may live long on the earth. You honor them not so that it will be well with them, but it will be well with you. And you may live long on the earth. I intend to live as long as I can. And you fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and the admonition of the Lord. If you wouldn't mind, take your seat. Let me just bless you with this. A few weeks ago, I was finishing up the, the Sunday morning service here uh, when an old friend of mine who I hadn't seen for quite some time walked up to me, and I hadn't seen them for a while, and they walked up and said, I, I have something here. I'm here on purpose this morning. I have a word from the Lord for you. And, and, and I said, go ahead and tell me what, what it is that God's put in your heart to tell me. Now, to qualify this, I wouldn't say that to everybody. I, I've had people walk up to me and say they have a word from the Lord and, and then speak some kind of craziness, but this person I knew, I knew their heart, I knew that they had my heart, so... I said, just tell me what it is that God told you to tell me. And they said this very simple thing. They said, the Lord sent me here this morning just for this purpose to tell you that the Lord wants you to know he's not finished with you yet. There has been for the last few months a a, a strange developing dynamic that has been happening here since Jared has begun stepping into what it is that he's stepping into. Uh, So it gave me a chance to tell them, and it gives me a chance to tell you the the same thing. I know that. (laughs) All right? I know that. I know that the Lord is not finished with me, but I I believe that that as we move forward, I'm going to be moving into more of a, a patriarchal or an overseeing role in this church. My role in this church is going to become more of an overseer and and all of that, but, but I also know this very specifically for me, that the next season of my life is going to be invested primarily in men. I, I believe that is a word from God for my life. The next season of my life is going to be spent investing myself into other men, whether they be young people or older people. 
That is just what I believe that God has given me to do in this next season. So I, I want to be faithful to that. If you've been with us for any length of time, you know that I've already done that for years. It's been one of my favorite things. It's been one of the delights of my life to be able to speak into men. But over the next few years, I think that that's where I'm going to be leaning the hardest. And so today is another step in that direction. Today on Father's Day, I want to give a word for men. And I'm, I'm not just going to be addressing fathers. I'm going to be addressing men in general. And ladies, uh, we, we need your participation. I'm going to be speaking directly a word from God into men's lives. And I pray that it will be a strengthening time for everybody in here, myself included, that God would speak a word clearly to you in whatever season of life you happen to be in right now. And it will be, you'll walk out of here today saying, I'm glad I was in the house today. Let's pray. Father, bless us today with the word. Let your word be effective and power-filled. God, let everything that we do bring you glory. We stand in need today of your anointing, and we thank you for it. And they said together, amen. amen. I don't ever do this, but in preparation for the service today, I went to a tool that was not available 44 years ago when I started out in the ministry. I went to the Internet. I went to the Google machine, and I typed in the importance of men in our culture. I think it's a very powerful question. It's, it's one that you should ask yourself from time to time. How important are men? How important are men in our society and in our culture? Obviously, from, from the Internet, there were literally hundreds of thousands of responses of, of every different kind. But at the top of the page this day, there was a response that was generated from AI, which automatically made me mad. I instantly got mad at it. But for clarity, AI is the abbreviation for, for you old folks. It is the abbreviation for artificial intelligence. I agree with Elon Musk, who says that artificial intelligence is probably the most dangerous and the greatest threat to humanity as we move forward into these next few years. I don't think we learn anything from the Terminator. We still are stupid. We, but I read, I read this response that was generated from artificial intelligence. And if you would, put that on the screen for me, please, to start. The AI response was this. Men have traditionally been taught to be protectors, fighters, breadwinners, and defenders, and have been considered essential for the survival of half of the human race. <laughs> half? I'm not really sure how they did that without us before, but as I understand the way this works, it takes both of us. Um, they have been considered essential for survival of half of the human species. So far, so far, so good. They're not failing miserably yet. Second screen. However, masculinity is a complex concept that can be reinterpreted in modern society. This shift in traditional masculinity can help people reevaluate what it means to be a man today. My hackles started rising. I hope yours do too. My hackles, old people, started rising. Last screen today, men can take on more nurturing roles, such as becoming empathetic leaders and emotionally expressive fathers. And before anything, anyone misinterprets my position, I say to you clearly that on that slide right there, there is, there is nothing wrong with that until... What has happened and is happening happens until it begins to be taken all the way to the extreme. Until you take that all the way to extreme and all you are and all you become is empathetic and emotionally driven. If you live your life that way, all you are is responding to everything that happens around you and living a life drowning in everyone's emotions around you. You're not leading, you are responding to what's going on. So what we know is that for the last few years, the roles of men, and by extension of that, the roles of men, manhood, masculinity, and fatherhood, have been the subject of intense scrutiny and, and interpretation and redefinition. In fact, you could actually expand that to include everyone, not just men, but women and children and every other part of it, because now it seems that the society that you and I are living in right now is in this crazy rush to redefine everything 
and is not going to stop until, listen, I believe every shred of traditional roles are affected. And in fact, sometimes completely redefined and in other times completely reversed and left in the dust that, that 20 years from now, we probably will not recognize the things that you and I take for granted these days. We know this. We know this, that for centuries, men have been this and women have been that. We know that for centuries, men have done this and women have done that. That's just knowledge. That's just society. That those roles have been passed down from fathers to sons and mothers to daughters. I, 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 maybe you were like me, but I clearly remember times when I would just sit down with my dad and he would have those spontaneously teachable moments. And my, <clears throat> my dad would say, son, this is what a man is. I don't know if dads do that anymore. But my father would sit with me and say, son, this is what a man is, and this is what a man does. This is how a man behaves. A gentleman. A gentleman is moral. A gentleman is responsible. A gentleman is respectful. A gentleman is honorable. You, you, you don't blush when somebody says, oh, he's a pretty good guy. You know it's true. A gentleman will open doors for their people, open doors for their ladies. A gentleman, a father, will set into motion things that are good for his family, not just for now, but for decades beyond where he is. But what we're seeing in our time is an all-out direct attack on the God-given biblical roles that have been given to us by our Creator which has been devastating to our culture. And before, I'm going to preach before I get out of here. Before the internet gangsters show up, and I know they're coming, I'm not saying that there hasn't been a reason for some things to change in our society. There has been. We, we all know this. There has been change in our society because some things were outdated and some things were chauvinistic. Any of you that grew up in that, you understand that they, they just, they, they needed to stop. But now, in our time, we have gone so far down that rabbit hole of confusion and delusion, it's going to get bumpy, that we are putting tampons dispensers in men's restrooms. I don't think there's anything more unnecessary than a tampon dispenser in a man's bathroom. I got mad enough when they started putting changing tables in there. They started putting changing tables in men's rooms, and I was like, hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it. I don't even know what that's for. I sat on one that fell off the wall. I knew it wasn't for napping. <laughs> We're actually now in our time having conversations about whether or not men can legitimately give birth to a child. That is happening in our lifetime. Confusion, y'all, is everywhere. And, and being as compassionate as I can, and, and you won't think that I am, but I am, it is this deception, all of that deception, not the reality of the role of a man that has brought us to the brink of the destruction that we are experiencing now. Here's a controversial quote from your pastor. I believe this, that if men are not men, we do not have a sustainable culture. I'm going to preach. I said, if men are not men, we do not have a sustainable culture. It will unravel. And to add to that, if women are not women, we will also have an unsustainable culture. So now, since I'm a man, I'm going to let the ladies work on the ladies. Pastor Kathy, that's all your game. While I do whatever I can to help the man, and since this is Father's Day, I'm going to stay right there. I'm going to say some things. If, if being a man is challenging, and it is, if being a husband is challenging, and it is, then you can imagine that being a father is so much more than that. Because now, into the mix of all of that, being a man and being a husband, now you've added little living, breathing fragments of yourself into the world, in the personage of your sons and your daughters. How many of you realized when you had them that they were not really what you were expecting? How many of you had that experience? Ain't it funny when you see yourself in them now? Ain't it funny when you see yourself in them and you look at your parents and go, I can't believe where they came from. And they say, honey, they're just like you were. You can't believe it because you've already forgotten it. Being a man is hard. Being a husband is a challenge. But becoming a father, many times while we're still too young to even know how to take care of ourselves, can be a disaster with immediate and long-term consequences. And so as I speak to this this morning, 
Everything that I'm going to be saying is meant to encourage you, so take it for that. Take it as encouragement. So many times, and I've been in ministry a long time, I've heard people say to men, you should do better. I've heard them to say it to men. You should do better. You should be better. But no one really takes the time to tell you what that means. Okay, I get it. I should do better. I should be better. But what does that even, what does that mean? So I've navigated this life for 62 years, so I'm going to speak a little bit to it this morning. You're supposed to be strong, but not too strong. Because if you're too strong, you start to look toxic. Nobody wants toxic men anymore. You should be meek, but not too meek. Because if you start to be too meek, then you look weak. You should be outspoken, but not too outspoken. Because if you're outspoken enough, you start sounding like one of those crazy radicals that nobody wants to be around. You're supposed to be in control, but not too controlling. Because then you start to look like you're trying to control everything around you in your life. You're supposed to be protective, but not overly protective. Because then it looks like you're trying to be domineering for everybody around you. You should know how to do everything, but not show that you know how to do everything. Because then you look like a know-it-all. Or is this just me? I told you it's hard to be a man. You're supposed to do all of that and make it look easy. Men need to be told this until it finds its way into your heart that even though society and sitcoms and soap operas paint you to look like a complete loser imbecile, your place in society and most specifically in the family is incalculably important. Your place is more important than you think that it is. And that's why the devil has done everything that he can to rip you out of your place in your life. To rip you out of your place in society. To take you out of your place in the home. You are, here I go, by the authority and the design of God, meant to be the priest, the provider, the protector, the disciplinarian, the authority figure, the mentor, and the role model in your home in a way that no one else can do it. No one else can do it like you can. Research shows that even though children chronologically spend way much more time with their mothers than they do with their fathers, children will still look to their fathers first to lay down the rules and enforce those rules. Y'all want me to put it southern? When it comes time for something to hit the fan, mama bear can do it, ladies, right? But by design, that's not her place. Mama bear can do it, but by design, the littles will look over to dad to see what dad's going to do and how dad's going to respond to this and imagine their confusion when they thought they were going to see strength and they found nothing but weakness. As to your place in a child's life, in your child's life, an involved father, you've probably been told this your whole life, promotes inner growth and strength in a child while an absentee father reduces it. Your place in their life, every child wants to make their father proud. And so when a father is supportive, it has a profound effect and impact on that child's life. I'm going to say that again. Every child wants to make their father proud. And so when that father is supportive of that child in their life, it has a profound impact on their social productive development. You can fact check me on this, and I'm sure that somebody will, that when you find any person that is struggling with inferiorities and insecurities, I'll promise you that somewhere in the mix of all of that, what you're going to find is a weak absentee father. Every time. If a father is engaged, where's my dad's at? If a father is engaged, their children grow up different than everybody else's children. If a father is engaged, they talk different than everybody else. They respond to life different than everybody else. If a father is engaged, that child will grow up saying to the world around them, you cannot disrespect me because my father already taught me what respect looks like and I know that I am respected. That child, you need to put this in your, you can't shake me because my father raised me on a solid foundation. So nothing that you can do will shake me. You cannot break me because you did not make me. You can't bully me because my father raised me to be a brave man in the face of this world. You cannot intimidate me because my father taught me that we all put on our pants one leg at a time. You can't hurt me by rejecting me because my father made sure that I knew that I was a priority in his life. You cannot make me feel unimportant because I know that I'm important to my father. Isn't that good? Fathers set the standard for the relationships that their children will have. The way a father treats their child will influence the way they look at others as life goes on. Like it or not, young girls depend on their fathers. 
for emotional support and security. A father shows his daughter what a good relationship with a man really is. If, she is, if he is strong, she will look for that in every other man that she meets. If he can be controlled, and she can, she will. I'm trying. If he is weak, she will be forced into a role that she can fulfill, but wasn't designed to. Young boys model themselves after the character of their fathers. I did. Boys grow up imitating the behaviors that they see in their fathers. So if you have sons, listen to this. If that father is strong, they will be also. If that father is a caring man, they will be also. If he is respected and respectful of others around him, they will be also. If he is honest and moral and kind and polite and courteous, they will be also. I said this on Mother's Day. And to all of the mothers, you may remember it. You don't have to be a perfect mom, but you do have to be their mom. I couldn't wait until get to Father's Day so I could say the same thing to the fathers. You don't have to be a perfect dad. There has only been one perfect dad, but you do have to be their dad, and you do have to show up. If you show up, it makes all the difference in the world. Amen? Y'all are awful quiet in this Baptist church this morning. I shared this with the men in our online group. I saw this the other day. A pastor went on a, on a rant about men. And I shared it with, with some of the men in our online group, and, and he just said, we need strong men. We need men who have character. We, in our culture these days, we need men who have virtue. Men to whom moral excellence is a priority in their life. They will be moral people. They have moral integrity. We need men who know what it means to say your word and keep your word no matter what. To your family, in business, in life, we need men who understand what it means to just live right. Be honest. Be true to your wife and be true to your children. And he said this. He said 95% of being a good father is this. Just show up. Just show up. And when he said that, it spoke loudly to me. And I'll tell you why. Last month I was, I was praying about today. How, how, how this was all going to to play out and all of that. and You know, I don't know how you feel about it, but so many men dread Father's Day. A lot of men do. They just, they just dread Father's Day. So let's just soften it all up and, and say that on different levels, we all stink at it. <laughs> My hand's highest in the room. We, we're just not good at it. Nobody, we just, we all stink at it sometimes. So, in the back of my mind, I went back to my dad. I don't think there's ever been a better example of a man and a father and a husband than my dad. Those of you that knew him, you know what I'm, what I'm saying. He, he, was, he, was, he was an example of all of it. He was, he was the priest. He was the provider. He was the protector. He was the rule maker. He was the disciplinarian. My dad was strict. This garbage that these kids get by with today wouldn't fly in our house. He believed in honor. He believed in respect. You didn't back talk your parents. You didn't back talk your mom. He had boundaries in our family. And when you cross those boundaries, there was always going to be a consequence for that. My dad wasn't raised in the 21st century. My dad was a disciplinarian. He believed in corporal punishment. He would whip your tail. And he whipped mine frequently. And I'll promise you all this. I hope you all know me well enough to know this, that I earned every single one I ever got. I earned every whipping that I ever got from my dad. I, I, one night, one night after I had gotten a spanking, I went to my, to my room, and my mom came in to tuck me in. And my, my mom, when she walked in, I was still doing that thing, you know, how we... And, I, and, and just in a moment, I said to my mom, I said, he hates me. He hates me. He has to, he has to hate me. And I'll never forget it. My mom said, honey, what you don't know is that right now he's sitting out in the garage crying because he had to whip you. I've never forgotten that. He is the man I've always wanted to be. 
So I was praying about today, today. And one day I was, I was at the gym. Obviously, I go a lot. You can just tell why. I was in the gym, and, and a man I've known for many years walked up to me. Just Normally, people don't, don't bother me, don't talk to me at the gym unless you're Calvin. They don't bother me at the gym unless you're Calvin. And I could tell he had something on his mind. I've known this guy since the 80s, all the way back in the 80s, and I know his children. He's a strong Christian man. We talk about Jesus a lot. He raised a really strong Christian family. His family is amazing. A couple of his sons are in ministry. He's just a, he's just a strong man. And on this particular day when he walked up to me, his eyes were already filled with tears. And he was obviously emotional. So you know, this was one of those moments. So we stopped everything and we went and sat down. And he right now is in his mid-70s. He's, he's about 76, 77 years old. And when I asked him what was wrong, he told me this. He said that the week before... This before this week, he had just met his biological father for the very first time in his life. The week he was born, like three days after he was born, his dad left. And for his entire life, listen to this, his entire life, he's never known him. He's never met him. He's never spoken to him. Nothing. And we were sitting there and he said, honestly, in my young life, I hated him for that. I didn't know him. But I hated him. He left my mother. She already had four children. He was the fifth one. And three days after he was born, this guy left. And he said, I've always hated him for that. But the older I got, my hate turned to her. And about a month before this, about a month before this day, he found out that his father, his real father, only lived about 20 miles away from him and was still alive. So he, he found out how to contact him. He made a, a contact with him and set up a meeting, and he went to his house in his mid-70s. And he said, of all the things that he thought about, he said, all I wanted to do when he opened that door, he said, I just wanted to punch him in the face. I just wanted to beat him down. I wanted to ask him why. I mean, why did you do this? Why, why Was there something wrong with us? What? And he said, I was enraged until I pulled into his driveway. And when I pulled into his driveway, he said, the Holy Spirit just came down in the car with me and calmed my spirit down and settled me down. And he said, as I, and I opened my eyes back up and he said, I sat in the car in his driveway and I looked and he said, the house, the whole thing looked like a, dry, a junkyard. The stereotypical broken down cars in the yard, overgrown grass, the house falling apart, the porch parts of it falling off, just sitting on the ground. With the, he said, and what I noticed most of all, he said, was that stereotypical, dirty, filthy door. Y'all know what I'm talking about? You ever been to a house like that? You walk up to the door and the door is just filthy. Just covered in dirt and handprints and all that. He said, and I knocked on that door and all my anger went away. All of my anger went away. He said, the door opened and there stood this man who was my father. An old, broken shell of a man. He said he wasn't anything like what I expected him to look like. He looked beaten. He looked broken. By this time, he was in his late 80s. When they went inside, he said, I couldn't, I couldn't contain myself. He just said, I said, why did you leave us? Why did you leave us? And he said, I'll never forget what he told me. He said, this, this man who I have hated my whole life, that I have resented as a deadbeat father, looked at him and said, I left because I didn't know how to be a dad. And then he told the story of his perpetual dysfunction. Sometimes the stories that you don't hear are more important than the ones that you think you know. His own father was a hateful, abusive, alcoholic of a man who routinely, regularly beat his wife and his other four children. Before this kid was born, he would routinely beat his wife and beat all four of his children. He held a job. He went to church on Sunday, but he was a complete terror at home. His dad said, I left because I didn't know how to be a father. And I didn't want to hurt you 
like he had hurt me. I've lived my whole life ashamed because of it. Can you imagine that? In his mid-80s, I've lived my whole life ashamed of that moment in my life. And this man that I was talking to said, in that moment, I forgave him. I forgave him. I didn't ask him how. I didn't ask him why. But I knew that it was from his heart. His countenance changed. He brightened up. And he said, I don't hate him anymore. In my life, I've had the privilege of meeting some really amazing dads. I see them with their children. Some of these little ones that are on here, they don't even know how. They don't even know how blessed they are to have the dads that they have. They just seem to get it. They just seem to get it. They're, they're good dads. They're good people. They give children their time. They give them their attention. They're patient with them. They're loving with them. <laughs> Kids set the house on fire, and they're like, oh, that's the best thing you've ever done. Man, good job. I'm throwing mine in a wood chipper. I can say what many of you in here can say. I did my best, but I wasn't a good dad. I wasn't. I worked too much. I spent too much time working away from my children. Thankfully, thankfully, I'm a much better poppy than I ever was a dad. I get a chance to do it over. I get a chance to do it over. The evidence is overwhelming. That when a man takes his place as a man, when a husband takes his place as a husband, when a father takes his place as a father, not only in that society, but most importantly in the home and in the lives of his children, as the provider, the protector, and the priest of that home, the generational dynamic of that home shifts forever. The generational dynamic of that home instantly changes when that father steps into that role. Listen one more time, and singers, y'all come on, I'm worn out. You don't have to be a perfect dad. I don't know that there's any of us that can say that we are. You don't have to be a perfect dad, but you have to be their dad. You have to be their dad. You have to show up. You have to be involved. No one else can do what you can do. Take this from a 62-year-old grandfather with five wonderful grandchildren. Less stuff and more time. Less stuff and more time. Just stop buying stuff and just spend time and show up with them. The Word of God says, fathers, specifically fathers, don't provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up. That literally means to cherish them, to train them, to raise them up against all of the baffling winds that will push against them in, as they live their lives. Train them up, raise them up, and be the man of God that you're meant to be. Would you bow your head with me, please, just for a moment? Handing you the tools. People say all the time, you should do better. You should be better. This is how you can do better. This is how you can be better. God, make me the man of God that I'm supposed to be. Let me become the man of God that I'm supposed to be. Let me become the man I'm supposed to be, the husband I'm supposed to be, the father I'm supposed to be. It was a conversation, y'all, that changed, I think changed the course of my life for the next season. 70-something-year-old man with tears in his eyes telling me the story that three days after he was born, his father left him. And now he reunites with him. And the man's explanation was, I left because I did not know how to be a dad. And I didn't want to hurt you. 
the way that my dad had hurt us. I want to pray for men. I want to pray for men, husbands, fathers, grandfathers. I want us to pray this morning. If you don't have men, you don't have a sustainable society. If you don't have women, you don't have a sustainable culture. Yes, I truly believe that women are as strong as they are because they have to be. But according to God's word, and don't shoot the messenger, she is, according to God's word, the weaker vessel. And she is the helpmeet to that husband, which means that there are things that he does that she is never meant to do. So this morning, if we could pray, In a few moments, we're going to pray for the men. But I want to give an invitation this morning if I can. It's always the most important thing that we can talk to you about is the condition of your soul. If there's anybody in here this morning that you've come in here on Father's Day and you just need to talk to the Lord, in a moment I'm going to give an invitation for prayer and I want to invite you to come. But I also want to give an invitation this morning for men who want to respond, find a place to pray. And between you and God, pray that simple prayer. Father, you created me, you gave me life. You have a reason and a purpose for me. Let me become the man that you want me to be. Let me, in spite of all of the stuff that I've been through in my life, let me become the man that you want me to be. My wife needs me. My children need me. My grandchildren need me. Let me become the man that you want me to be. In a moment when they start to sing, the altar is going to be open to you. I'd love to see a flood of men. I'd love to see some man find a place to just pray. Pour out your heart to God. This could be the difference. This could be the difference. You could be the generational change in your family. This could be a generationally changed moment. Let me be the man that you want me to be. Let me become the father that I need to be. Let me be the husband that you want me to be. I'm also going to invite people that are still carrying some wounds. This man's story probably is a little more common than we want to admit. So this morning, if you happen to be in the, in the building or want to to lay something down this morning. Maybe what you don't know. It's just as important. Maybe what you do know is that forgiveness is still the way. No matter what the, the issue or difficulty, just to, to say, forgive, I forgive, I forgive, I forgive. Help me forgive. All across the building, if you wouldn't mind, stand up on your feet. I know it, it just got heavy in here for a moment, but it'll only be a moment. I promise you that the Holy Spirit will lift those burdens. You guys, come on out. And altar workers, I don't know how necessary you're going to be this morning, but I'd love to just give people a chance to pray. I'd love to see, I'd love to see some men finding a place to pray. Father, have your way in my life. Let me become the man that you want me to be. Father, have your way in these next few minutes. Let everything that we do bring you glory. And we thank you for these changing moments. Somebody say yes. We thank you for these changing moments. This might be the Sunday that you say, honey, I'll be right back. This might be the Sunday that you say, honey, I'll be right back. I gotta pray. And you find a place. Hey, I hope that message spoke to you today. I want to say thank you to everybody who is involved at Family Church and those who help support this ministry. If you would like to get more involved, you can click the link in the description or head to our website, familychurch.social. We would love to connect with you, and you can find all of our social media platforms on our website. 
Also, if this message spoke to you in any way today and you liked it, consider sharing it on your social media in any way that you would like so that we can help reach those far from God and return them to the arms of the Father. We want to see God work through you. We love you. Thanks again for listening. God bless you.